Carpathians, one of the most beguiling and mysterious regions on Earth. Over the centuries, it spawned countless legends and inspired sinister depictions of a place often viewed through a darkened lens. But as we showed in episode one, the reality of this preternaturally beautiful mountain range is very different from the fevered imaginings of Bram Stoker's gothic prose. Here is the last great wilderness in Europe, where predators like wolves, bears and lynx still roam freely and traditional rural cultures survive despite the rush to modernize. This time we follow the southern arc of the mountains, from the Iron Gates, a deep gorge carved by the Danube, and heading east through national parks, past hot springs, ancient citadels, monuments, wineries and medieval villages. We rejoin the Danube on the other side of the mountains, where it branches like an enormous tree to form its dendritic delta. On the way, we will see very different environments. The Carpathian Mountains, home to the largest concentration of old-growth temperate forest in the world, and by contrast, Europe's most expansive wetland, a vast reed-covered haven for rare and exotic fauna. The Carpathian Highlands are a catchment zone for hundreds of water systems that flow inexorably into the Danube, like the Cherna River, which converges just below the Iron Gates. As with much of Romania, this is an area rich in history. In this place, Roman Emperor Trajan built the first bridge across the lower Danube, enabling the deployment of troops for the war against Decebal, king of the native Dachin tribes, whose depiction you can see carved 40 meters high into the cliffs at Orsheva. On their march towards the Dachin capital, Sami Sejatusa, the Romans discovered a utopian valley where hot water flowed steaming from the hillsides. Here they built opulent baths and founded the town of Herculani, which grew to become one of the world's most famous spa resorts. But since its heyday in the mid 1700s, Herculani has fallen into decay. Only now have its fortunes begun to recover, with a new five-star hotel about to open and a raft of other projects in the pipeline. The old town is constructed around springs, which possess differing mineral properties, believed to cure a variety of maladies. For instance, there's one for the eyes, another for intestinal complaints. It was in the 1730s, during the time of the great Habsburg Empire, that Herculani rose to prominence. Numerous regal resorts sprang up, all dressed in the gilded opulence of Austrian Baroque, and host to a firmament of kings, queens and glitterati. However, the end of the Habsburg era and the steady decline of foreign visitors meant that its fortunes peeled and faded like the plaster and paint that covered its palatial streets. One of the victims of this creeping dereliction is the Neptune or Imperial Baths. It's an absolute tragedy when you think that this used to be arguably the grandest spa resort in Europe. Thankfully, there are now plans to restore this incredible monument, along with a number of other historic structures. So hopefully, in the not too distant future, this well-kept secret will once again become the pride of Romania.
An edifice less likely to collapse anytime soon is this concrete leviathan, a communist-era construction that, like a Russian doll, hides deep in its belly a priceless treasure, the original Roman spa. A building within a building, these baths are almost unchanged from the days when legionaries and centurions alike immersed themselves in their healing waters. The fame of the springs was such that it spawned a legend from which the town took its name. Baile Herculani, or the Baths of Hercules, was alleged to be the place where the son of Zeus stopped to freshen up before heading off to tackle the Hydra. A fight so monumental that the serpent's death throes wrung great gouges from the bedrock, the evidence of which you can still see an hour's drive further upstream. For the majority of Herculani's residents, however, the easiest way to enjoy a thermal bath is to head to one of the communal open-air watering holes on the banks of the river. The surrounding hill country above Herculani is wild and solitary. With high rainfall and a filigree of streams, the local people still harness the power of water to help with the daily grind. This really is the ultimate in sustainability. Serena brings her grain up here by cart. She grinds it using the water from the river and then she transports the flour back to the village again by hand to feed her family and her pigs. At no point is any electricity or gasoline used in this process. It is the preservation of these cultural traditions that makes rural Romania such a unique place. With the rush to modernize, much of this may soon be lost, along with sustainable farming methods and a natural symbiosis with the landscape. The Carpathian foothills northeast of Herculani provide an ideal climate for the renaissance of an industry that was banned by the Dachans because of its detrimental effect on discipline namely viticulture. Today, entrepreneur Sherban Dermbovicanu is combining age-old agricultural methods and the latest technology with award-winning results. The, the natural environment here makes a microclimate, which is very good for the wine growing. So the forest contributes to the flavor of the grapes? Yes, exactly. Our uh, vineyards are surrounded by very old natural forest. So this microclimate helps a lot uh, in getting a very original taste. When we uh, took over this place, we found only ruins after the, the communists and uh, we had to start again from zero. So we replanted again everything and uh, we uh, renovated the cellars. In fact, uh, at the beginning, I was thinking uh, uh, at the, this activity more like for a hobby, like, uh, but there is a lot of hard work and the now uh, is taking uh, all of my time. And of course it provides employment for lots of the local people. Yes, and this also brings me satisfaction to see uh, those people having a job and which gives them life back. And uh, I see their children who like this and maybe, who knows, they will start studying enology because what we do here, we do for generations. And what are your plans for the future? We want to extend our cellars and uh, we plan to build uh, guest rooms and also a new tasting room. It's very good for us to show to our customers how we grow the grapes, how we do the wines. And uh, we want also to offer people, besides the visit of the vineyard and of the cellar, uh, we want to, to, to visit uh, the surroundings, which are very nice in the Carpathians. There are beautiful places to visit. Heading across the southern arc of the Carpathians, we reach another spa town, where for years people have been harnessing the hot springs, not just for bathing, but to provide energy. 
Kalamanesht is a community edging ever closer to the ultimate goal of living entirely off the grid. An unlikely example of this is the venerable Kozia Monastery. Beneath its serene, picturesque exterior lurks an innovative heart that pumps and processes geothermal water to produce electricity and heat. Zona is known for about 2,000 years ago, when the Romans came and they found their castle in the part of the wall, which, in fact, they found there at the interference of the Arde and the Roman Empire, and there were those bulls of sulf, the geothermal water, which was on the surface. Și, într-adevăr, și ei foloseau, după care locul acela a rămas până 80, când s-a construit barajul, care, de fapt, așa a acoperit apa respectivă, iar asupra izvoarelor minerale, cum se zic, acelei curative, și-au pierdut din eficacitate care a fost originală ea dinainte, până a fi cursul râului normal. Iar pe cealaltă linie este energia electrică care este bine venită. The rare beauty of the hills around Kalamanesht has had a strong spiritual significance since early Christian times. It's amazing to think that for hundreds of years before the monasteries sprung up in this area, monks were coming to these grottoes to meditate, to contemplate and to live, eat, sleep and spend their days communing with God in total isolation. Rising heavenward above the River Alt is the Great Kozia National Park, containing some of the highest oak and beechwood forest in Europe. Although Romania's old growth hardwood areas are particularly vulnerable to illegal logging, thanks to successful management and the vigilance of park wardens, this mountainside stands a good chance of remaining intact. Travelling east again, you reach the roof of the Carpathians, where the mountains are at their most bleak and breathtaking. Here, the serpentine Transalpina coils around cliffs and snow-capped peaks, providing one of the most beautiful and precipitous drives in Romania. It is from these lofty heights that you can truly see the scale of the wilderness. This sea of green that stretches to the horizon contains Europe's last great expanse of pristine forest. Sadly, you can also see the extent of its ongoing destruction. Below the tree line, much of the forest has already been lost, in part due to the restitution of land to private individuals who then harvest the wood or sell on the logging rights. I am on my way to meet one of the most outspoken of these landowners, a well-known figure who works tirelessly to address this and many other social problems, Princess Margarita of Romania. Restitution and private property, for me anyway, this is where I'm coming from, is absolutely essential to a modern democratic state. But having said that, I think that the restitution process was badly done. First of all, it was done in dribs and drabs, it was done in a chaotic manner and it's led to chaos, just what you're talking about, the deforestation, corruption, selling of wood on the black market, illegal logging. If people can get away with wreaking absolute havoc, then they're going to keep doing it. First of all, you need a good legislative framework, you need a good body to enforce that, and then you need sanctions and incentives, obviously. You're not going to just punish people, it's ridiculous. And there are quite good laws, but they're not respected and they're not enforced. This has to be done if we want to get anywhere. But it's also to do with attitudes and education. Unless people are really educated to respect nature, and I think a lot of our children do have that respect, 
If you don't have respect for one another, you don't have respect for nature or for the elderly people who have been very, very badly treated here. Once you're over 50, you're finished. I mean, it's just go out to pasture. So my foundation is linking the old and the very young in all sorts of activities together, and they're learning from each other, and they both value each other. And I think this is a vital, vital importance. And a lot of people said to me, you can't raise money for your foundation because old people are not sexy. But in fact, the amount of knowledge that the children get from them are extraordinary. And there's a huge spark of energy that comes out of that connection between the generations. Do you think it's possible for people living on the edges of the forest to have a sustainable livelihood from, from the forest itself? Yes, I do. If you set in place a proper policy and proper rules and regulations that people who can work from crafts, from cultural tourism, agro-tourism, etc., this is something that can definitely be, allow people to make a living out of their, their land. And it has to be done because forests in Romania should be a strategic development point in the whole of Romania. It's not something that can be used up because once it's used up, it's gone. It could be the best brand Romania has. There's no choice. Either you do it or it's the end of everything. And it's absolutely vital to the future of Romania. One area that is thankfully now protected from hunting and logging is the Bucec Natural Park, a short drive from Brasov. For an overview, the more intrepid can hire a microlight tour of the surrounding wilderness. Not necessarily something to do on a full stomach, however. But for full immersion, the only way to properly appreciate this vertiginous paradise is to pull on your walking boots and head out on one of the many trails that crisscross its rugged slopes. To keep me on the straight and narrow, I was joined by guide Juana Michai and a team of local rangers. They are very careful about uh, this area. They uh, do not allow to cut trees. Animals are protected and uh, nature is in uh, its wild form. So there's no hunting here at no, all? No, Not even in a, in a limited, sustainable no, way? No, no hunting, nothing. I wish more areas of the Carpathians were like this. It would be lovely because here the nature is in its purest form. The ecosystem regulates itself? Yes, it is not uh, interrupted by humans. Do you think this is the way forward for this part of Romania, that by attracting people here for adventure tourism and hiking, that it will provide a sustainable income? for the people who live here? Definitely, because uh, we have the place that uh, allows us to do adventure tourism here and uh, people really need this money income, com yes. Yes, coming from tourism. Hiking through pristine forest, past alpine meadows and razor-sharp crags, you are once again overwhelmed by how fragile and unbelievably precious this landscape is. The main base for exploring Bucec is Bran, which is dominated by an impressive Gothic castle. A popular spot for Draculophiles, despite its origins as a minor border keep, with no connection to Vlad the Impaler whatsoever. Nevertheless, Bran Castle is a good example of successful restitution. Its Gothic splendor draws tens of thousands of visitors every year, and the tourist industry here is booming. 
The castle was nationalized in 1948 together with all other royal assets. In 2001, a new restitution law was adopted. At that time, the owners filed a claim for restitution. And five years later, in 2006, they managed to uh, finish the uh, restitution process. Uh, it took only five years. In many other cases, it took much more. In some cases, claims are still not settled. So it is a successful story. The new owners have started uh, a very comprehensive renovation program. And as a result of that, a number of uh, uh, houses in the Castles Park have been re uh, renovated and a number of rooms in the castle. The number of tourists has uh, increased ever since 2006 at a rate of 15 to 20 percent per year. Uh, that makes it a much better tourist attraction. And the castle is now open to private events. It happens on a very frequent basis that uh, uh, people are coming to celebrate to Bran Castle. As a result, the uh, whole village of Bran profits from the restitution. How do you as a Romanian feel about most people associating Transylvania so closely with Dracula? Well, some Romanians believe that uh, Dracula uh, being associated so closely to Transylvania, it's an insult to Vladimir Paler, who was a hero of uh, Romania and has defended the land against the invaders. Personally, I believe that the myth of Dracula, it's a very good story, it's universal, uh, people want to hear about it, and therefore we should use it and be proud of it. If you prefer somewhere a bit wilder and more in keeping with the surrounding environment, there are also a number of spectacular lodges that offer a more authentic way to experience this breathtaking area. Like one overlooking two national parks high on the Balaban Hill outside town. built by visionary environmentalist and filmmaker Dan DiMancescu. Well, this is kind of a, a little mini miracle. I've been coming to Romania for many times now, since the 1990s, and um, on one little trip I came on this hilltop and just fell in love with it. But there's a bit more to it than that, because my family uh, originated not far from here, about 30 miles south in the Carpathians, and uh, we have a long history of land ownership there, so this was kind of like coming back home. And did you originally start with the idea to build a hotel? I was thinking of building something, and um, the connection that was kind of interesting to me, I came here in 1968 working for National Geographic on a story where I walked from the Ukraine to the Black Sea with colleagues, and we did a story on the Carpathians in 1968. We came around here, and I sketched a little building in my notebook, and by a miracle, that building was taken to Sibiu, to the Ethnographic Museum. I saw it, and this is a carbon copy of that building that I sketched in 1968. Uh, and uh, I'm a kind of an aficionado of architecture, and when I see these buildings, I see a very beautiful, uh, elegant design, almost Japanese in elegance. So there's been a lot of pleasure creating this. Uh, the most important part was that we had craftsmen from Svante Gurgia, which is a Hungarian-Romanian community not far from here, who know how to work with wood. And they were very good craftsmen, very good craftsmen. The Carpathians are beautiful mountains. But one thing that's gone wrong is that as people have new money, they build houses very quickly, and cement is the preferred material. It's cheap, you can do it fast, and there's a kind of a creeping cement culture. And it's been very difficult, at least with uh, Romanian friends, to persuade them that peasant or local architecture is the right way to go, that it can be modernized. Because there's still that memory of ancient peasant homes with the animals and the smells and all of that. So I think we're, right now, in these years, we're beginning to see the bit of a shift where Romanians are realizing that there's something pleasant about this and that the modern concrete building may not be the most comfortable environment. Visiting settings like these helps give you a real insight into traditional Romanian life. It's also worth sampling the local cuisine with a glass of palinka and, if you're lucky, a bit of live music. <laughs>
It's places like this lodge near Bran that are at the forefront of cultural tourism in Romania and represent one of its best hopes for the future. The capital of this area is Brasov, a vibrant city with great cafes and restaurants, beautiful churches, and a dramatic, if slightly derivative, backdrop. From here, you can head north to experience Transylvania's Saxon communities. The chief of these is Sigishwara, one of the country's most visited attractions and the alleged birthplace of Vlad Tepes. Founded during the 12th century, Sigishwara is widely regarded as among the best preserved medieval citadels in Europe and one that has never been conquered. Fed by its own wells and enclosed with gigantic walled towers, these ancient houses churches and cobbled streets remain locked in time. Each of its 14 towers were built and maintained by a guild. Among the most striking is the clock tower, which controlled the central gate and stored the city's treasures. Today, nine of these towers are still standing, and one charity is working to repair and preserve them by returning them to the crafts and guilds responsible for their construction. Trust is an organization that works to preserve the cultural heritage and the identity of the villages in Transylvania mainly. It took this name because Mihai Eminescu is, as you may know, the Romanian national poet. And what the trust and himself have in common is the idea of preserving our national identity. And this is primarily within the Saxon areas of Transylvania? Most of all, we work in the counties of Brasov, Sibiu and Mureș. And we're working in the villages, the villages that were populated by Saxons, Saxons who most of them left after the, the revolution and who were then repopulated by Romanian and Roma population. But also we're working in Sigishwara, where again we're trying to touch the architectural heritage, the tower that you're seeing here, as well as the natural heritage. But it's not just about preserving the buildings, the architecture itself, is it? It's not. One thing that is specific to Romania and it makes us proud is that this architecture, this wonderful nature is lived. The human communities are very much alive everywhere and the trust is trying to preserve this as it is, to give people an opportunity to have a good social, economic and cultural life here. Not to live for the bigger cities, not to live abroad. Our intention would be to have in time in Sigishwara a craftsman working in every tower. Sigishwara may be an impressive place by day, but at night it becomes something else entirely. I know that Romanians are fed up with references to Dracula and Nosferatu, but standing here in what is arguably the birthplace of Vlad the Impaler, one of the oldest citadels in Europe, and seeing the glistening flagstones in the darkness between pools of lamplight, you do feel as if you've somehow stumbled into a gothic horror. As we continue our journey towards the coast, the mountains give way to lush pasture and rich agricultural land, once again ideal for Romania's burgeoning wine industry. Further southeast, the foothills melt away completely, and one increasingly encounters a different kind of wilderness. When Romania joined the EU, many of the old ineligible factories, hastily built under communism, had to be abandoned. Today, they are slowly rusting and crumbling back into the ground, providing an unlikely haven for wildlife. 
Here in Calarash, the old steelworks serve as a backdrop to what has become a vibrant wetland and a sanctuary for birds. might not be to everybody's taste, but I think there's something profoundly beautiful about this post-industrial scene because it represents a rare example of nature reclaiming the landscape from man. The water that flows out of the Kalarash lakes continues a short distance to merge with the Danube. Now even larger than when we saw it last and thanks to the vast alluvial plain it has to cross to reach the coast, about to undergo a dramatic transformation. As it nears the sea, the Danube divides into a labyrinth of channels, a vast reserve designated by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. If Ceausescu had had his way, all of this would have been drained and converted into farmland. Instead, it remains the largest wetland area in Europe and one of the most biodiverse regions on the planet. The Danube Delta has been described as the Amazon of Europe. 2,200 square miles of rivers, canals, marshes, reed-fringed lakes and sandy islands. This eulogenous Eden harbors over 300 species of bird and 45 different types of freshwater fish, providing a critical habitat for many endangered animals and plants. A multitude of people come here every summer to savor life on the water and sample the Delta's unique cuisine. And restaurants and hotels like this one, situated on the banks of the Salina Canal. Gabby, this is all traditional local food from the Danny Delta, yeah? Yeah, sure. The name is Chorba of Storchak, of salt. This is a salt. This is a uh, very expensive uh, fish here. Fish. In the, yeah. The som means um, sleepy fish, yes? Sleepy fish, yes. Okay. <laughs> so it's very lazy. It translates, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's lazy, very, very yeah. lazy, yeah. It's very important, traditional sherpa, to have uh, a lot of fish. This much. What else have you got here? Let's show me Show me in yeah. here. What, what is this? This is wild boar. Wild boar, yeah. stew, like a, yes. a casserole. Yes, yes. Okay. And they prepare with the name uh, Tokitura, the goulash. I like a goulash. I like okay. a goulash. Okay. And now to, to, to see another fish, this is carp. You see, this is a sport fish in England. Yeah. You don't eat carp. But in Romania, it's it's very good fish to eat, yeah? Why did you decide to come to the Delta? Because uh, it's wonderful here. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, paradise here. The heat is, uh, is very... The food is amazing. Yes, With the pressures of modern society and the toll it takes on our system, more people than ever are choosing to spend holiday time revitalizing their body and mind.
In Romania, we have everything you need to make this a reality. With a wealth of geothermal springs and an entire third of Europe's total hydromineral reserves, this is one of the best places on the planet to relax and recuperate. Here, steaming alkaline, saline and sulfuric water bubbles out of the ground. And remote mineral lakes and mud baths provide a unique opportunity to detox and soak away the aches and stresses of daily life. Thermal waters are recommended for a wide range of maladies and complaints, from rheumatic and respiratory disorders to digestive and metabolic problems, kidney-related conditions, renal disorders, high blood pressure and stress. Romania's many modern and historic spa resorts offer a huge range of different treatments and attractions, from the uber-luxurious to the traditional, the sedate, to the more aerobic. Whatever the requirements, this is the perfect destination for people seeking a complete mental and physical makeover. Set against a backdrop of stunning scenery, wild forests and towering mountains, our many spas also sport a natural gymnasium for those in pursuit of peak physical fitness. Whether you're looking for an intensive program of massage, healthy eating and outdoor pursuits, there really is nowhere like Romania to help you turn over a new leaf. Sardinia is the second largest island in the Mediterranean and its capital, Cagliari, is on its southern tip. The Castello area is the oldest part of the town, perched high on a hilltop overlooking the port and surrounding coast. The views from here are impressive, but deceptive. This city actually has a relatively tiny population, just over 150,000 people. Guarding the city like giant warriors are two 14th century limestone towers, Torre San Pancrazio and Torre del Elefante. Both towers form part of the city's old defensive walls, which surprisingly are for the most part intact. Originally built in the 13th century, the Cathedral of Santa Maria and Santa Cecilia is a popular attraction. The facade combines medieval, renaissance and baroque. Two huge stone pulpits flank the main doors, while a couple of marble lions guard the altar, and underneath, a heavily decorated crypt houses the remains of royal martyrs. A favorite part of the city is the Roman amphitheater. It was built in the hundreds AD and could hold up to 10,000 people, half of Cagliari's ancient population. Gladiators emerged from the tunnels. The underground cages where the men and wild animals were kept can still be seen. Today, this is the setting of musical extravaganzas. One of the most beautiful parts of the delta is Letia Forest, the oldest national park in Romania, located between the Selina and Kilia branches of the Danube. Access is by horse and cart from Letia village, a community that can trace its ancestry back to the lip of an immigrant 
who came here over 200 years ago to escape persecution by the Russian Orthodox Church. This is the most northern subtropical forest in Europe. It's the habitat of a plethora of fauna, the largest being the Danube Delta horse, subject of much recent debate following its unscheduled release in the wake of communism. Environmentalist Liviu Mihaiu has been campaigning to highlight the impact of this invasive species. I know there's been a lot of controversy about this issue. Some people have said they should be culled, other people say they should be allowed to roam free here in the forest, but there has been an impact, hasn't there? Already a visible impact. Yes, the specialists saw this impact on the trees, on the species, and uh, maybe in 10 or 20 years will be a mess for this uh, unique forest. You know, it might be a irreparable damage yeah, to the ecosystem. They are not to be slaughtered, they are to be relocated. Maybe 100 of these horses maybe remain here for, for the, the tourists. tourists. And maybe one day we'll have a Romanian Mustang, you know, in this forest after five or six maybe generations, you know. Of course. The traditional way of life here in the Danube Delta, as with other remote corners of Romania, remains largely uninterrupted man living in harmony with nature. Although sadly, that is beginning to change. The biggest influence, both in terms of its destruction or salvation, once again, is us. The exodus of inhabitants is dwarfed by the annual influx of tourists. As with some areas we've seen, unsympathetic development is burgeoning, while riverbanks and waterways are being damaged by speeding traffic. But there are people and organizations working to save this watery paradise. Like an initiative to encourage a more harmonious approach to exploring the Delta. I caught up with founder and former Olympic canoeist Ivan Pitsaikin, for whom this region has always had a personal significance. Pe care mi-l aduc aminte, mi-aduc aminte că m-am trezit într-o dimineață în baltă cu bunicul meu. Eram în vârful bărci, așa. Și asta mi-a rămas foarte plăcut, impresionant. Școala, îmi plăcea la școală să merg, pentru că de foarte multe ori la școală trebuia să mă deplasez cu barca. Toate lucrurile astea erau pentru mine Normale, iar in Chocolipa nu m-am gândit ca voi ajunge si in sport. So now you've moved back here and you're involved in various projects. What are you doing? Este proiectul România care promovează un turism lent, care promovează tradițiile si cultura din zona, protejează si natura. Așteptăm si turisti care se respecte această frumusețe de lucru. Toro, you're working with Ivan on this, yes? Yes, and it, it's a great honor for me. One of the targets of our project is to bring tourists which is interested uh, about what the nature and uh, the local people can offer without any special uh, investment. And this is the reason why Ivan and me, we are not trying just to promote the ecotourism. We are also trying to build partnership with association which can bring know-how. And uh, I think if we put on the same level the need of infrastructure with the need of protecting nature, and we will invest the same amount of energy, money, and proud in this, I think uh, we can solve this problem. Despite its natural beauty, the Danube Delta is one of Romania's poorest regions, with some local communities lacking even basic services, such as electricity, running water and waste collection. Many of the inhabitants rely on subsistence agriculture and fishing, with communities depending on the summer months to generate sufficient income to survive through the winter. While the Delta still has an abundant supply of fish, Numbers are declining rapidly due to overfishing and poaching. 
Today, five out of the six species native to this region are listed as critically endangered. Standing between them and extinction is the last line of defense, the people whose job it is to protect this fragile ecosystem. This is Fierrell and Vasily. They're part of the Delta police team. Our job is to come out here at night and try to catch the poachers, which is not an easy task. As dawn breaks, we join one of the other teams out on patrol. Tensions are high as news comes through of a potential sighting. This guy looks like he's a legitimate fisherman. So the next thing is they take his details down and then go back and check them at the station. But even if he is legitimate, you still have to work out whether they're taking the quota or not. Pentru a forma un om să lucreze pe linia asta de muncă e foarte greu pentru că delta Dunării are o întindere foarte mare, o suprafață foarte mare și fiecare ar trebui să cunoască exact zonele în care lucrează, în care își desfășoară activitatea. Moments later, we have another sighting. The team rolls into action. We could hear the distant hum of an engine, but it was proving difficult to pinpoint its location. With hundreds of square miles of overgrown waterways, this can be mission impossible. Why do you think that guy got away? Apa mică, vegetația deasă, au bărcuțe mai mai mici, dar n-am făcut datoria și nu ne-am N-am dat înapoi și braconierii trebuie să înțeleagă chestia asta că nu o să dăm niciodată înapoi. Tourism is now providing an alternative livelihood for many inhabitants of the Delta. And encouragingly, more environmentally conscious hotels are springing up amongst the reeds. I spoke to the founder of one of the first. JB, how long have you been living here in the area? Yeah, I started for, for 10 years ago walking and travel around the area, the Broja country, and uh, I get an inspiration from the peasants' houses. And I like to continue the traditions, you know, that I build the, the houses and the walls is the yellow clay, and uh, of course with the roofs, the reeds roof, you know. What I find constantly surprising is that despite the fact this is quite an inhospitable landscape at times, there is such a rich convergence of history here. You know, the first one was the Greeks, we have the Romans, after that, the Turks. And if you look there to the right side, you know, the road, you know, is the road is, is the Silk Road. The Silk Road to Krakow and to Lyov, which was a very important city. Getting out on the water and seeing the wildlife may be one of the chief reasons for visiting the Delta. But the cultural landscape is equally compelling. Like the medieval villages of the Carpathians, the traditional way of life has endured here, unchanged for hundreds of years. I love the fact the boats are so old and well maintained. I mean, you can see that one's been patched up there. Those boats are typical uh, fishermen's boats, uh, lipovens, the, the Russian fishermen, you know. And uh, how you see, you know, they put two boats together, you know, when they, when they take the nets off from the from the water, you know, it's a look at like a real catamaran. Yeah, they boats, stabilize yeah. them. Very stabilized. Clearly they can't do this all year round, because looking at the amount of fish they're pulling out, if they did that every day, there wouldn't be any fish left in the lake. I mean, how long does the fishing season last? It's a special situation with this, uh, with this lake, it's called a Babadag Lake. The fishing season is an all, all year season. The guys from here have a special fish farm for the small fishes, you know. So they're constantly restocking the lake yes, with, uh, with, yes, with young yes, fish. Yes. How often do these guys come out here? They are coming daily, except on, uh, on Sunday. They start rather early in the morning, half past three, four o'clock. They already get a breakfast around the six o'clock, you know, yeah. and around 10 o'clock they have a fisherman soup. It's been their lunch time. And they make that out here? Yeah, they make it out in, in their in their boats. It's an old tradition. Bon appetit, Charlie. Yes. Oh, 
That's sensational. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I know they eat this every day, 365 days a year, but I wouldn't get tired of it. It's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're, they're really strong and slim guys, you know, you can see it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think the taste, you know, is, is the water lake, you know. Well, there's so many fish in this lake, it seems that the water is probably like a natural fish stock anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, not so sure about the brandy, but um, <laughs> not the brandy. would they be having brandy yeah. at this time of the morning? You know, they start to have a brandy very early in the morning and very late in the night time, you know. Well, of course, yeah. they're Russian, that, that is typical so. Russian tradition, you know, <laughs> yeah. to, to enjoy the vodka. You know. Another important aspect of Russian-Romanian culture is music and dancing, as Jibi and I were lucky enough to witness that evening. As the delta finally merges with the Black Sea, this part of our journey comes to a close. Over the last hour, we have seen many contrasting environments, all of which are fragile, stunning and irreplaceable. Romania is a country of epic beauty, boasting Europe's largest surviving area of virgin forest and its greatest wetland. But these are not just worth preserving for dry academic reasons. It's landscapes like the Danube Delta and this one here in the Carpathians that could ensure a lasting prosperity for the people of Romania. If they're properly protected and managed, then they'll become an inspiration and an example to the rest of the world. However, if the rivers are polluted and the forests felled at their current rate, then this whole region will resemble that hillside behind me, as bleak and ecologically barren as Snowdonia or the highlands of Scotland. <laughs>